And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Omar Ricci, spokesperson for the Islamic Center of Southern California, and he is also a board member of the Muslim Public Affairs Council and the Intellect, Love, and Mercy Foundation. Today we're going to talk about the correlation between the stories of NDEs, OBEs, and Islam, and the belief in Prophet Muhammad's OBE, which he came back with the mandate for five daily prayers. Omar, thank you so much for being my guest, and welcome. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Omar, so how did you get involved or interested in NDEs in the first place? Well... Uh, the idea of an afterlife, the idea of what happens after we die, has uh, a great significance, is really a central theme of the faith of Islam. And what happens after we die uh, is, is you know, still sort of an unknown in many respects. So when we would hear stories or when I would hear stories of people's NDEs, um, you know, I think, you know, when, when you hear the first one or two stories, there may be some dismissiveness to it, but then when you hear the number of stories that keep coming out, the similarities between the experiences, and then not only that, the uh, matching of what they experience in, in their NDE to some of the things we hear about in the Quran, um, such as encountering a light, such as seeing those who have passed on, such as um, you know uh, encountering love, uh, experiencing love and uh, undescribable love, uh, it, things that you hear uh, in some form or fashion in the Quran. And so uh, as you start to hear those stories, uh, in the NDE experiencers, and I, you know, I think this is the case for people of all faiths, that um, they, uh, it's, it's a strengthening of faith. It's a strengthening of your belief in God. It's a strengthening in the belief that you exist beyond just this life, which is, again, very much a central aspect and central part of what we believe uh, as Muslims. So that's sort of where it all came from. All right. If you don't mind, let's jump right into Prophet Muhammad's OBE. Sure. Okay. So the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I'll say peace be upon him from time to time. That's our tradition as Muslims to wish peace upon him. Um, he, he, the, the, what we traditionally call it in Islam is Isra wal Miraj. Uh, it is the night journey. Um, and it is an ex mystical experience. It is one that, uh, really would not be able to withstand scientific proof. And I think that's a lot of what faith is, uh, being able to believe in something that's not necessarily scientifically provable, provable. But just to give a little background to where, when that happened, it happened um, uh, in what's historically called the year of sadness for the prophet. So he was uh, at sort of at the, the sort of first third in his 23 year mission uh, to preach the word of Islam. And in that sort of time, he was in the city of Mecca and he was encountering not just resistance, but violent resistance. And um, um, he was, it, Mecca at the time was a very tribal society, uh, almost gang-like society. And in order for him, I mean, he had, he had got himself into trouble in terms of preaching this message of the unity of uh, God, that there's only one God in a society that worshiped idols, uh, literally stone idols. And so um, the worshiping of the stone idols brought people together and it was sort of a source of economic power as well because there was the Kaaba the the black cube shaped building that you may see from time to time uh, well prior to Muhammad's arrival um, and there's a whole history behind that building that I won't get into and how prophet Abraham built it with his son Ishmael and and what have you but that 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 had eventually over the course of time now came to house idols and so and there was an economic power that was built behind it so in, in, what, in what the prophet was doing, he was preaching a message that said, don't worship the idols, worship the oneness of God, worship a one God. And it was a threat to traditional uh, uh, tra tradition there and within the city. So 
he had fallen because it was a tribal society and people wanted to sort of do him harm. His uh, uncle was the head of one of these tribes, basically, and and in being so, uh, protected him, protected Muhammad, protected Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and that protection then you know it, it sort of made him immune from being attacked. Uh, so in this year of sadness, his uncle died. His protection, the person that was protecting him, died, and so now all of a sudden, you know, it's like you had, you know, a protector that now once he's gone, game's on. We're going to potentially take your life. In that same year, um, his wife, Khadija radiallahu anh, she may peace be upon her. She's one of the great. She was the very first, the very first Muslim in 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 this. It was a was a woman. Um, Khadija was his wife, and the way to understand how who she was to him is that uh, she was indeed his soulmate. And, and I mean that and many of you viewers understand the concept of soul, soulmates and how we are. So he, he considered her his soulmate. They, their marriage was a very strong one. Uh, he said that you know, when, upon her death that God made her for me. And, and so he had a very, and he, although she was 15 years older than him, but it is in the same year that she perished as well. So his protection goes away, his wife dies, who he was deeply in love with, and now he needs to find he needs to find some place. And, and by the way, his wife was a very rich woman, so she was sort of the the breadwinner, if you will, in the family. She was a very a shrewd uh, tradesperson. He loses his protection. He loses his wife, which who's also you know one of the persons that was helping him and taking care of him in many respects. And so now he's trying to find other places to go to. He goes to another city called Taif, and they basically run him out of town. They stone him. Uh, and so he, he's in this very, very difficult situation. And this is all leading up to the OBE now, okay, the Isra al-Miraj. I'm calling it an OBE. I'm probably the, one of the only Muslims you'll find calling it an OBE. But the fact that I've heard so many stories of OBEs and NDEs, it is now... In my personal opinion, and I'm not speaking on behalf of any organization at this point, uh, that is what the prophet experienced. He experienced an OB. I want to stop you just one second, and I just want to let people know that if you're new to the channel, when he is saying OBE, he means out-of-body experience. Thank you. Yes, exactly right. That 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 it it wasn't his physical body that that experienced this. It was his soul or his spirit or his consciousness that experienced this uh without sort of getting into the nitty-gritty details the prophet muhammad one night um uh, fell asleep near the kaaba near that black cubed building and as the story goes the angel gabriel or jibril the archangel who has uh, has a very special place in Islam as being the angel that revealed all the messages, came to him and sort of said, hey, wake up, wake up. And at first he didn't wake up. Then he sort of said, hey, wake up, wake up. So finally the prophet arose and you know saw that it was the angel Gabriel. And the angel Gabriel said, come with me. And he brought him to the, just to nearby, to what is uh, to not a horse, not a mule, but a special creature that looks more like a horse, uh, who is named Borak, B U R A K or B A B U R A Q, um, and this was the steed, the beast, whatever you want to call it, that he mounted to now start his special journey. And in mounting Barak uh, with the angel Gabriel accompanying him, he flew from Mecca to Jerusalem originally. Okay, there, were, there are two parts to the journey. The first part is from Mecca to Jerusalem. And while, you know, which is, you know, a month's journey of time at least, if you were to do it by caravan at that time. He flew to Jerusalem, and this is where the Dome of the Rock is that you see there, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, that area there. Uh, and it was there that Muslims believe that the Prophet Muhammad met with other prophets, or met with other messengers, Jesus, Moses, uh, Abraham, and 
prophet that at, at that point, he led them in prayer and worship of God. It is from that point, and there's a, it's designated, it's there today, the rock that, that's known or believed that this happened on, or the place that this happened. It is from that point that now he started to ascend into the heavens, okay? And that there are these, there are the seven heavens or the seven levels that he ascended through, all right? And as he ascended through each level, he met different prophets and messengers, the same ones. So um, if I just sort of refer to my book here again, he, re he met uh, Adam, he met John and Jesus on the second level, the third level he met, uh, uh, met Joseph and then Enoch and then Aaron and then Moses and then Abraham. And then he uh, ascended to meet God. And so it was in this journey to the uh, to ascension through the heavens uh, that uh, he then ascended and had the glory of meeting God. Had something that we all hope that we'll eventually be able to accomplish and achieve, which was meeting the creator of us all. And it is in that meeting with God that now the prayers, you know, the five daily prayers that we have as Muslims was established. And the story goes is that when he met with God, God told him, okay, Muhammad, and I'm paraphrasing here, uh, the believers in Islam are going to be mandated to pray 50 times a day, five zero, 50 times a day. Prophet Muhammad said, okay. And he started to then descend back through the heavens. And then he met Moses and Moses stopped him and said, what, you know, 50 times a day, that's going to be too much. Go back and petition your Lord to reduce the number. So the prophet Muhammad went back up and went to God and said, uh, you know, can we, you know, I'm so sorry. I'm not trying to use irreverent language for anybody who's listening, but, you know, it, it, I'm sort of paraphrasing the story here. Can we reduce the number from 50 to a different number? So we reduced by 10 to 40. Uh, Prophet Muhammad started to go down again, descend through the heavens. And Moses again said, 40 is too much. And this, this, this time, the amount of prayers and the meeting with Moses and the ask and the instruction sort of and the advice from Moses to Muhammad to reduce the number of prayers and to go back to God happened so many times that it was then reduced finally to five. And so the five prayers that were then that the Prophet Muhammad came back with and as he is descending, Moses again stopped him and said, five is still too much. Go back and ask your Lord to reduce the number of prayers. And the Prophet Muhammad said, I, I, my Lord, I'm, I'm too shy to do that anymore. I, I, you know, I, I, I've gone back too many times. Five is the number, and that's what he came back with. Okay, so what I'm trying to get at is the following: is that, and then he came back down, mounted Barak, came back from Jerusalem, came to Mecca, came back into Mecca, and he was placed back into his body. Now, there's been great debate over the centuries if you will, about whether this was Muhammad's physical body going or whether it was his soul going. And I think in the modern day that we live in, and now that we understand more about out-of-body experiences and we hear the stories about NDEs, in my mind, personally, there is no way his body would have gone to have traversed such a journey to ascend through the heavens, so on and so forth. I believe it was his soul, his consciousness that, that did that. And then I don't think there's any harm in applying the modern day term of out of body experience to what he experienced himself. Um, and so, you know, it's a mystical story. It is one that, uh, uh, that you know, and I'll talk in a second about the reaction to the story that when he came back with that, but, what I guess what's important, because a lot of Muslims, when you tell them sort of these mystical aspects of Islam, they have a sort of an adverse reaction. And I'm here to say that you're, if you are a practicing Muslim, your five daily prayers are based on an out-of-body experience. You're waking up before the sun rises and after it goes down at night and at the noon hour and the afternoon hour and 
sunset is all based on the Prophet Muhammad's mystical experience. So it is it is part of our faith, and and to deny that is to sort of then sort of not accept some of that aspect of our faith, in my opinion. Um, so <clears throat> the Prophet Muhammad came back, and uh, he uh, awoke from the experience, and there were, he was. Uh, he was uh, he had dinner at a at a friend's house, if you will. Because um, Umhani is her name, and so when he awoke from this experience, he went to her, and he told her the experience. And you have to keep in mind this was just a few years into the Prophet's twenty three year mission, and the people that had come to Islam, there were some that were very deep in faith, but there were some that were very sort of tentative in their faith. And so when she heard this story from him and he sort of turned to go now tell the story, she grabbed him by his tunic. She grabbed him by his clothing and it sort of came off of his clothes and said, my God, please do not tell anybody what you've just told me. Please do not tell anybody what you've just told me. This is too fantastic a story. This is too unbelievable. This is not uh, within the realm of rea reality. Please don't tell anybody. And he said, by God, I will go and tell them. And a couple of things that came to mind. First of all, I'm, I, I, I always has, I've, I've always found it very interesting to see the timing of when this happened to Prophet Muhammad. You know, oftentimes you hear people who have NDEs or OBEs, they come back with a renewed spirit, a renewed sense of faith, a renewed sense of what this life is about, and put in context all the trials that we have in this life relative to the afterlife that we'll all go to. And I look at what the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, where he was at. He had lost his, his beloved wife which was taking a toll on him. He lost his protection and he was getting, you know, uh, his life was in danger. And so the OBE, uh, and I will call it that now, that he had came at a time where he was really downtrodden. He was very, he was in a very desperate, difficult situation, let's put it that way. And I believe that happened, and God knows best, that and it happened at a time to renew his spirit, to renew his soul. I mean, one of the things that the story also talks about is that when he got to the top, the highest level of heaven, that there was a lot tree there. And we all know that the lot tree is a symbol that's talked about in other faiths in Christianity and Judaism, I believe, as well. Um, and, and that the lot tree was there. Uh, and, and that it was enshrouded and, um, and that it, was, it, it held a very divine source of knowledge and held the signs, I should say, of his Lord, the greatest. So um, it was at the low tree that the Prophet Muhammad received uh, uh, the command for the prayers. So the low tree has a very special symbolism in our faith. And by the way, I'm, I'm taking it from the book Prophet Muhammad by Martin Lings. Um, the low tree has a special significance in this, but coming back to where he was, he had this experience. And if, if it was anything like way, what we've heard from these other ND years and people about it, the amount of love that I'm sure that he felt, the amount of fulfillment that he, to put all in context, what we what what's happening in this world and the very short life that we have here, uh, I think was very significant. I think there was a lot more to be said and understood about what that experience was, the Isra al Miraj, in light of everything that we're starting to learn about OBEs and NTEs today. Um, this is, you know, what I'm saying is probably very much outside the bounds of what has traditionally been sort of studied and thought of and, and the, the the volumes that have been written. But I think there's a lot more to understand because when you hear about the OBEs and the NDEs today, um, uh, you're, you know, they're 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 almost uh, irrefutable the amount that they have and the number of people that they, that have experienced it, et cetera, et cetera. So when the Prophet Muhammad came back, he shared the story, 
and his enemies actually rejoiced. They were like, we got him. This guy's a nutcase. Hmm. How could anybody follow this guy now? All right. So they almost like laughed. You can, you can, the way the stories are told, like they laughed in jubilation, like this guy's a nutcase, right? Nobody's going to follow him. And in fact, there were some people who had converted to Islam that said, yeah, I'm sorry, it's too much. I, I can't, I can't, I can't be a Muslim. And so they immediately left the faith. Uh, but then there were others who, while they found it fantastical, uh, there was a companion of the prophet uh, named Abu Bakr, uh, may God be pleased with him, who said, if the prophet said that, that happened, then it happened. And uh, he was then given uh, the title Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, the one who, is, uh, who confirms the truth. So, um, so I guess I wanted to, you know, in, in listening to the NDE stories and, and the OBE stories, there's a great deal of similarity and comporting, if you will, with what at least my faith teaches. And, and by the way, I'm not here to ask anybody or to proselytize or anything like that. Everybody has their own journey to God, whether you're Christian, Jew, Muslim, Hindu, whatever, you have your own journey. I just found it very reaffirming of my faith about what uh, some of these ND ears and OB ears are, are, are sharing and what my faith teaches as well. Um, and, you know, the afterlife plays, like I said before, a huge role in what our faith and in, in how we, it plays a huge role in our outlook of this life. Um, there's a verse in the Quran that says, that, that, that the, the afterlife, the akhira, is far better and far longer than this earlier, shorter part of life that you're in right now. Uh, and that there are, uh, that this life is meant as a test. Uh, it, it's meant as a trial. There's another verse in the Quran, uh, the English it goes, we have created you into a life of pain, toil, and trial. And, and that this life is really a test. Now, why we're getting tested, why we're here, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think anybody can answer that with any sort of high degree of certainty. Does it mention anywhere in the Quran about reincarnation? No, it does not. That is not something that Muslims believe in. We do not, we do not believe in reincarnation. I will say this. I will say the Quran is silent about reincarnation, meaning that it's, it, is, it is not something that has been said that is part of who we, our souls go through. Uh, but I, you know, I'm happy to hear if anybody has any uh, comments, you know, about it, uh, that I have not found anything in the Quran, and I've read the Quran a few different times, that says that that does not happen. So I, I'm going to say that it's silent, mm -hmm. but I would say it's, it's, it's a better than stronger understanding that we do not believe in reincarnation. Well, can you tell us what happens to a person in Islam when a person dies? Okay, yes. So, um, so when a person dies, so there, there, there's generally five stages that the, the Islamic scholars have come up with of what happens to a soul, pre-birth and after death, if you will. So um, the pre-birth aspects are a lot less sort of understood, and I can share that, I guess, a little bit, but the real, your question about what happens after we die. So we go to the grave and uh, we then, th and there's various accounts of what happens that you will be approached by angels at that point and start to be asked about what did you believe in? What did you do in this life? But the one, th and that's based on certain sayings of the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But the verse in the Quran talks about something called, um, uh, the veil, uh, oh. and in, in, in Arabic, it's called the barzak, that you will now move, your soul will now move out of this life, out of this dimension, into an intermediary place, the barzak. And the Quran also says, and I'm paraphrasing, that we have not revealed much to you about what happens. So whatever you do know, it's just a little bit whatever is shared with you in the Quran or whatever is shared with you in human experiences, just a little bit. But when a soul dies, 
it then goes into the Barzakh. And it is there that not much is said, but again, over the years, people, the scholars of Islam have uh, uh, have theorized, have uh, sort of stitched together understanding based on different verses in the Quran, have stitched together understanding based on what they've read in Judaism and in Christianity as well, sort of to come to the feeling or to the conclusion that it is in this space that you then get to rest. You then are filled, uh, you're, you're resting from your journey, from your test and from your trials and tribulations in, in this life. And there's different opinions, there's different thoughts and not everybody you know, will, will agree with what I'm saying, but that I think that is sort of the, and for purposes of this podcast, sort of the overarching perspective, you get to then go there. And, and this again is where I see more sort of thought or clarity or idea or compulsion with what NDEers say they experience, right? They go to the, I mean, there's generic, right? I've, I've, Dr. Jeffrey Long has his uh, number of uh, things that happen. You know, you go through a tunnel, not everybody, well, not everybody goes to the tunnel, but generally speaking, you go through the tunnel, you meet the light, you're filled with love, a type of love that can't be described. And so one would imagine that when you're in going into the barzakh, that you're leaving this life, and if you go through that tunnel, and if you start to see the light, and then you feel the love, that's part of the equation. That's part of what happens. Uh, but nothing of that comports or is, is spoken about in Islam. Um, and, and so you're now in this barzakh, in this, in this, in this place, uh, we are resting. And, you know, what happens to the bad person? What happens to the evil person? What happens to the good person? What happens to the righteous person? We don't know exactly, right? There is the concept of heaven and hell in Islam. Uh, and by the way, I, you know, what also should be made clear is that in Islam, in the Quran, it doesn't say you have to be a Muslim in order to get to heaven. The thing, the the criteria for which to get into heaven, as outlined, as said by the by God in the Quran, is uh, you just have to believe in me, and you have to do good works. Hmm. Those are the two things. Doesn't say you got to be a Muslim. Doesn't say you got to be, you know, you got to pr even pray five times a day. It doesn't say that you don't do any sin. I mean, you don't do sin. I mean, it's very clear that you don't. But the concept of compassion, of forgiveness, is huge in our faith. And so there, the, the verse that has always struck out, stuck out at me, it's, I think it's in Surah Al-Baqarah in the second chapter of the Quran that says, you know, so long as you believe in me and you do good works, you're good to go. And no worry shall you have. That's, that's, what, that's the way it puts it. No worry shall you have. Hmm. So, so the soul moves from this life into the barzak. In the barzak, it's not clear what happens. I think... To some extent, what happens in, in my mind is informed by what I'm hearing from NDEs nowadays. But then after that, there is now the Day of Judgment. And the Day of Judgment, uh, Yomi Din is what it's called, um, is where Muslims will now be judged for their deeds. Now, I find it interesting. Is that the same thing as what you hear about, about people having a life review? Right. In their in their in their NDEs, I don't know, right? Nobody knows, but as far as you know, how it comports with what Islam says. But the idea is that you are going to get judged for your deeds, good and bad. And the very interesting, you know, aspect of Islam is that if you uh, if you uh, uh, if you intend to do a good deed and you do it, you will get blessings for it. If you just, you know, you get a certain number of blessings. If you intend to do the good deed, but you don't do it, you still get a blessing for it. If you intend to do a bad deed, but don't do it, you still get a blessing for it. If you intend to do a bad deed and you do the bad deed, then you'll get, a, you know, basically a demerit for it. All right. But the point is, is that there's, there's the, the, the amount of weight that's given to doing good deeds is, is there. And so you go to the day of judgment. Forgiveness is a certain is a huge part of our faith, and it is at that point that you will then you know learn your record. Again, is that the same thing as a life review and feeling what you how you treated other people? And I think that's one of the key things I've taken away from NDEs that I've heard is that you feel how you how the other person felt when you said what you said or you did what you did. 
Um, to me, that's been a very powerful um, aspect of understanding because Muslim, Christian, I mean, okay, you may know all the religion, you may do all the, the, the ritual, you may do all the prayers and everything, but if you talk to people poorly, and there's a, uh, there's a hadith about it as well that I can find here shortly, but if you talk to people poorly, if you treat people badly, if you make them feel uh, not nice, if you will, that has, uh, that's looked down upon. Often with people who have NDEs, the life review is more of a self-judgment than God judging you. Is there anything in Islam where it's shown that the people are judging themselves? No, no, no. There, there's very much, and, and I, I, yeah, I, I definitely understand that component. But from an Islamic standpoint, no, God, God is the judge. God is the judge. Uh, and, and we will have to, you know, answer to him about what we do. Now, what is interesting in Islam, prior to your being born, uh, and it says this in the Quran, that God breathes his breath into you. So from a Muslim standpoint, there is a part of God's breath in each and every human person okay that's that's a verse in the quran uh so so the basic idea in and that and to get back to what you're saying does do, do, is, it, is it a is it a self-review or whatever well in you know we all have come from one living entity that that's a, the very first verse in the fourth chapter of of the quran talks about us all coming from one living entity all right and you've heard this also, again, from ND years and OB years, that we come from one living place. Like they feel that they have been, that when they, when they go back to, the, to, the ND, to their ND, they go back to the light and they become part of the light. All right. And so that, to my mind, comports with what we hear, read in the Quran about God breathing his breath into each and every one of us. And so... Uh, there's a part of God in each and every one of us, according to the, what we believe as Muslims. Um, how that manifests itself, how that happens, is is, is a different question. But that 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 as humans, we have taken on a very special responsibility here. As a matter of fact, um, I was just listening to something earlier today that faith in God and the uh, uh, what we do as humans to go through the tests and trials that we go through was offered up to the mountains. It was offered up to the skies. It was offered up to the planets, but none of none of them wanted to take it on because of how huge of a responsibility that is. But the human being took it on to then, um, you know, to 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 take on this worldly affairs. And to take on the, the the mantle of faith and to practice it, and that's there's a lot of philosophical, of course, and religious dimensions to that. My point is is that God breathed His His soul into us. Now, what I'm trying to get at also is um, prior to us coming here, and I mentioned this before about what happens pre-birth. There's not a lot said about that, but that our souls existed prior to coming here, existed in the heavenly realm. And, um, and and then when our mothers became impregnated with us, our souls came to our to our spirit. Our souls came from the afterlife, from the heavenly realm, into our mothers' bodies at about the 120 day period of the pregnancy. Okay, and this is based on verses in the Quran and based on uh, a saying of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, peace be upon him, that. Uh, it is at really the, the the fourth month in the pregnancy that our souls now come into the wombs or what is the embryo at that time. Um, and that differs from, you know, different faiths beliefs, right? So God talks about in the Quran, how he first creates us from sort of this, the splotch of sperm and the embryo and the embryonic egg and that bones start to form. And that it is then, that only after that point then that he breathes his spirit into into you and that's the uh, symbolically saying that's when your soul enters the womb 
enters the body. And it is generally understood that happens uh, in the first month of the second trimester, right? Um, and so, you know, that comes up in the whole debate about abortion and everything else, right? So, um, so the idea of that is our souls come in at that point, breathe into our womb, into the mother's womb, into uh, the fetus at that point. What is Islam's stance on abortion? Yeah, so you'll find a varying, you know, uh, perspectives on that. But I think that there there are some who say no, you should you should there should there's no room for abortion once you know that you're you know pregnant, no matter how uh, early in term it is. But I think the the there is I think a um, consensus uh, amongst many that abortion prior to the 120 day mark or in the first trimester is not a good thing, but is acceptable. Uh, and that the mother's life is, uh, and certainly in cases where the woman's life is in jeopardy, the mother's life is in jeopardy is acceptable even after uh, the, 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 the third trimester, uh, sorry, the second trimester. From what you are saying, it's interesting because it sounds like our, you know, our consciousness, our soul is already existing before we take the body. Yeah. So the Arabic term, the Quranic Arabic term for soul is ruh, R-U-H. And yes, we are, we, the idea is that we already do exist. Um, and again, as it says in another part of the Quran, God tells us that he has not revealed very much about it. It's still a mystery for us as Muslims of what happens. And I know all the stories of people who say that you had your family prior to coming here and the soul contracts that are developed. And it's interesting. I was, I was just, uh, there is a hadith, the saying of the prophet Muhammad, um, that is in found in, uh, in, uh, the books, uh, the, the sayings of the prophet Muhammad were gathered into different books. There's a famous, uh, collector of sayings. His name is Bukhari and Bukhari has these sayings. And one of the sayings that he found or that he lists is, um, that, the, the, the Prophet Muhammad said that the souls prior to coming here were lined up in arrays, like in a, like a, like in a, in a, in a rays in, in the heavenly realm. And that they knew one another in the heavenly realm. And that they had relations in the heavenly realm. And that souls that got along in the heavenly realm prior to coming here, when they meet each other in this life, they get along very well. Mm. And souls that didn't get along very well in the heavenly realm, if they to meet each other here, they don't get along very well. Uh, and again, that's a hadith in the in, in Sahih Bukhari for the for the Muslims that may be watching. So so that's not Quran, that's hadith, and it it, it introduces a lot of well, what does this mean? What are you know? What are you, okay, the realm, the array of where we where we lights, you know, and that and God is described as nur as light as well. So when we talk about the NDAs, you experience the light. So, um, so there's there's bits and pieces of information that you find on the podcast. We talk about archangels and angels in general, and what I find fascinating is that Archangel Gabriel revealed the Quran to Prophet Muhammad. So can you? tell me and tell the audience how that came to be how that played out okay i will try and keep it uh, condensed because it's a big story but essentially and before his prophethood came about muhammad peace be upon him was known um um as a very trustworthy as a very stand-up person who also sought spirituality, who sought uh, self-reflection, who sought contemplation. So <clears throat> he used to go to a cave outside the precincts of Mecca to meditate, essentially, to try and understand the world that around him, to try and understand his place in the universe, if you will. He was an unlettered prophet. He did not know how to, to, to read or write, but he had still obviously the mind and so he would go to the cave it's called the cave of hira 
and he would he would reflect and he would spend days in this cave sort of just trying to understand and 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 in, and in self contemplation and reflection it was on one of those nights and it happened in the month of ramadan you may have heard of the month of ramadan in uh, that we were fast uh that uh the prophet muhammad then the angel gabriel came and sort of essentially took him by the collar and said read and the prophet he was shocked i mean can you imagine just something coming out of nowhere in a cave and just taking you read and 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 he was told again read read and his response is i don't know how to read and the angel gabriel said read read in the name of the lord okay and essentially instructed the prophet now and that was the start of his mission and and those very first words can be found in the quran uh and it was it was the archangel gabriel that came down and revealed the message there's a lot more history to it there's a lot more uh, uh i'm not giving you the full I mean, you have to read about it but the point is is that and there's plenty out there to read but the point is is that that was the starting point that was the point that the, that Gabriel came and in the cave uh and that cave exists today that's what they people believe and people go visit it and and what have you and again outside just outside of Mecca um and that started the 23 year uh a mission and and the you know two dec over two decades worth the revelation that came from uh God through the angel Gabriel to Muhammad did archangel Gabriel appear like in the flesh as an angel and did it does it describe what the archangel looked like and then also I'm just going to ask this and you can answer this as well mm -hmm. when we when you're saying he revealed the Quran would he just like dictate it to him in the flesh and Prophet Muhammad would write it? Or or how did that come about? Okay, good, great question. So the first part, uh, I don't know um, if Angel Gabriel ever appeared, how he appeared to the Prophet. Uh, there are stories of how he appeared, uh, uh, of how he got revelation. So when the Prophet Muhammad used to uh, get revelation. It was a very taxing experience on him. So he was basically getting this download of a, of 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 of, uh, of the message of the Quran from God, and then once it the revelation was complete, he would tell people the revelation. He would orally transmit the revelation. Okay. These revelations were then written down. Okay. Uh, uh, and by the way, the order of the Quran today is not the order of revelation. The revelation came at different points in time. The, organ the organization of the Quran today is different. It's not, it's not a chronological. It doesn't start you know, with read and it's, it, the order is different and, and the arrangement of that is, is a whole separate subject. But the idea was that the Prophet Muhammad would receive the revelation receive a download he would be with people even there's one story where he was with his wife and you know he be, he sort of fell into his arms and he sort of got the revelation it was a very taxing experience and then he would tell people what was said and it was written down and then the compilation of all the revelations and the ordering of it came afterwards um but in his life uh, it is, it is, uh, and in the Quran, be, even before Muhammad, when the, the Quran tells us the stories about Jesus and David and all the other prophets that we know about in the Bible, for example, and there's, they're all mentioned there in the Quran as well. It, it does talk about how angels took human form, and angels came and spoke to the prophets and took human form. So the idea of angels amongst us today is very real. As a matter of fact the concept of guardian angel exists in the song. As a matter of fact, they say we have two angels, one on each shoulder, one on the right shoulder who's writing down all your good deeds and one on the left shoulder is writing down your bad deeds. Um, and, and that angels are around us. It talks about how in certain situations with the prophet Muhammad, uh, that the angels came to help him in times of, uh, of war, to be honest with you, in times of battle. 
So <laughs> the point is, is that angels are very, are, are center, are, 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 are part of our faith. Uh, and and, and um, to my mind, that's not just an, a, a fable. It's not just something that was limited to that time. Angels are around us today, as I'm sure all your, the, the people that explain their NDEs and their OBs sort of share as well. And I believe as well. And I think any you know, practicing Muslim would believe as well that angels are very much a part of our lives, that angels exist, uh, that they are there as our guardians, that they're, they are there as our helpers. And you cannot be a Muslim without believing in angels. And so um, uh, they play a, a role in, 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 in our lives as well. Um, there's also another creation, I don't know if this is gonna be a question to read, you know, there's something called the jinn, mm -hmm. uh, J-I-N-N. -N. So Muslims believe that on this earth, not only are, is there the creation of human beings and all the animals and, and other creation that we can perceive and understand and see with our own two eyes and measure, et cetera, but there's also something called the jinn. The jinn exists, we believe that jinn exists on this earth, that they are created out of fire, and that they also have free will like humans have free will. And that there are good jinn and bad jinn. And by the way, jinn, I think that's where genie comes from, for example, right? So you know, jinn and I think genie is where over the course of time has, has come in from that uh, understanding. And so jinn exists, that there can be interactions between humans and jinn, that jinn can um, uh, have a negative impact on humans it can also have a, po a positive impact on humans as well. They're not angels, but they're one of the creations of God. Obviously, a lot of people believed Jesus and followed him. And then also there were some people that didn't believe him, especially like a lot of the rabbis. And so he was, you know, maybe considered like a rebel. It sounds like to me that Prophet Muhammad kind of had experienced the same thing that he, there was a lot of non-believers and he was kind of like a rebel is that true exactly that's very true i think that's a great way to put it and i think you would find that that could be said about virtually maybe with the exception of solomon uh, all the prophets and messengers that when they came to the communities that they uh were intended that god told them to deliver the message to they were always rejected so uh, on Jesus, because not a lot of people know this, we believe in Jesus, not like Christians do. We don't believe he was the son of God, but it, we believe that he was the spirit of God here on earth. Uh, we believe in his miraculous birth. We believe in the Virgin Mary. As a matter of fact, there's a whole chapter in the Quran called Mary. Uh, we believe uh, that Jesus had the ability to heal the lepers, bring the dead back to life. Uh, uh, and that he is for us the Messiah, that he will return. It is Jesus that will return, not Muhammad, Jesus that will return um, as the Messiah. So Jesus plays a very central role in our faith. To your question, though, you're absolutely right that Muhammad, Jesus, Noah, uh, Abraham, Moses, all the prophets, experienced a, um, uh, a, a rejection from the people that, they, that were around them, a deep rejection, a violent rejection of what they were trying to preach because it upset the apple cart. It upset what was uh, traditionally being done around them, uh, sort of whether that be what one may think of as uh, irreverent or, 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 or immoral practices, I'll just use that term for now, uh, doing things that were worship, you know, taking away, detracting from the real central aspect of the central idea of worshiping God, a one God. And I think that's, it's not just about worshiping one God, but all that that brings as well, the centeredness, the, the, uh, the sort of the approach to life uh, when you're worshiping a stone idol, and I'm not trying to disrespect anybody or anything, but you know, worshiping, say, a stone idol versus worshiping the creator of the universe and the multiverses and beyond. 
So Muhammad very much fit that mold, and that's the mold not created by Muhammad, but the mold created by God. That you're gonna the prophets had to go through horrendous tests in their travails and in their lives. Some of them failed at it. Like if you take um, and and were forgiven by God, like if um, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the prophet uh, that was in the whale, uh, not Ayub. It was um, no, forgive me. I can't remember the name now. Um, Jonah, prophet Jonah, uh, that was swallowed by the whale. And why was he swallowed by a whale? I mean, God gave him the command to take the message message to the people of Ninivne. And he, the people of Ninivne rejected him. So he fled Ninivne and he fled the, the, the mission that God gave him. So I guess what I'm trying to drive at is that this idea of, um, uh, of, of people, of prophets rather, having these, you know, being placed in situations where they're naturally going to sort of upset the society that they live in, I think that's, that's, that's a pattern that we see. It's fascinating to think about because we talk a lot about people getting downloads, people channeling information, and I'm sure that there are pretty famous books even today about channeled information or downloaded information that it's still going to be ridiculed so or re- and or rejected. Even yeah. if information comes today, it's much more difficult probably than back then to be accepted. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, for us as Muslims, we, we believe that Islam is the final message uh, revealed. Um, and again, that's not to take away anything that a pe- you know, certain people may have experienced in their NDEs or the downloads that they may have had. Mm-hmm. But this, as far as a comprehensive message for humanity, that's what we, we as Muslims believe, that is the final message revealed uh, to humanity through the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, uh, and, and, and so, yes, back then, the idea of, and that was one of the things that was said to Muhammad back then. Well, I mean, first of all, he was told like, well, first of all, who are you? I mean, you're just a poor kid in, in, the, in the Arabian desert that's like one of us. I mean, if, God, if there really was a God, why wouldn't he send like some heavenly light coming down from the skies and sort of, you know, wowing me us with, you know, some miraculous thing. And his basic response was, well, if God chose to do that, that would be his choice to do that. But here I am, and this is what God has given me. And this is what I'm revealing to you. All right. I can't t- tell God what to do. This is essentially what is happening. You choose to believe or not to believe. Um, and he found, he found, you know, he found, of course, you know, the followers that he found, and, and it, it continued to grow even beyond his passing. Was the information that was revealed to him, like, so overwhelmingly amazing that it's obvious that it's not coming from you, it was given to you? So, so everything that was revealed to him is in the Quran. So the Quran, the words that were revealed and that were written down and that were then compiled are in the Quran. And it is the same words today as they were over 1400 years ago. So if you pick up a Quran from a thousand years ago, let's say, you would find the exact same words uh, as the Arabic text that is, as you find today. I guess what I'm trying to ask is when Prophet Muhammad would you know, speak this information, would it be obvious that what he is saying is so profound that he didn't make it up? It would be like it had to be coming from God. Yeah. Okay. So yes and no. What do I mean by that? People, there was once a, there's a story of these tribes realizing that Muhammad was now an influence but an influence that was going to threaten their way of life. And they had already tried the way of sort of intimidation and violence, and that wasn't working. So they got a learned man who was, uh, you know, a very learned man to sit, and they, and they told him, listen, go talk to Muhammad and tell him, if, if you want to become the king of Arabia, we'll make you the king of Arabia. If you want money and women and whatever else, we'll give you that as well. 
Um, and, um, you know, but just stop preaching this message. So the man went to Prophet Muhammad and he told him, look, if you want to become the king, we'll make you the king, so on and so forth. And the prophet, and he was listening, the prophet was listening very respectfully. And the prophet said, okay, are you done now? And the man said, yes. And he goes, if you put the sun in my left hand, and you put the moon in my right hand, and you gave me all that was on this earth, I still would not forsake this message of Islam. And he then continued to reveal or to share verses from the Quran to this man. The man, he now started to doubt it, what he was doing. And he came back to the to the to the tribe, to the tribal leaders who had sent him. And the tribal leaders said, okay, so what happened? What did he say? And the man said to the tribal leaders, leave this man alone. He's speaking the truth. He was he is speaking something that is not of this world. And what I'm driving at is that there was nothing like. Oh, you know, like like a Nostradamus predict what's going to happen a year from now, and all of a sudden it comes true, and then yada yada. That's oh for sure, that's the revelation. It was appealing to what was being revealed. What it was and is attempting to appeal to the soul, to the spirit, to the nature of us as humans to 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 elevate ourselves, and that is there's nothing inherently like miraculous in the words per se. I mean, there are parts of the Quran that talk about, for example, the Big Bang. There are parts of the Quran that talk about how uh, uh, humans are created with sperm entering the embryo. All right. These are things that were not known 1400 years ago. All right. There are uh, verses in the Quran, you know, that, 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 that speak to things that science had not discovered at that point in time. So you can, you can over the course of time, understand that right but at that point in time in the immediacy of, of the 23 year mission you know his mission started when he was 40 years old and ended when he was 63 upon his death um there was nothing like a, a, a miracle like you know i mean and there are stories of miracles by the way now you know there's a story of how the prophet muhammad uh you know from a small container of food was able to feed hundreds of people who were hungry, all right? And that the food kept coming, all right? So there are miraculous stories. How much credence is lent to that is, is up for debate. Within the Muslim world, is, is still up, to, up for debate. I mean, you know, of course, anything is possible with God, so that could have happened, all right? But some people doubt it because there's, it's just not scientifically, you know, provable. But then I go back to what I said earlier. Uh, a lot of what we believe uh, is not scientifically provable. So um, it's a matter of faith. Are there any other correlations between the supernatural or NDEs that we haven't already talked about and Islam? You know, again, the big one for me was the Isra al Miraj and the night journey and this, you know, taking to the seven heavens and coming back with the prayers. Um, that is probably, you know, the most mystical story that we have in our faith that is not up for debate it's not up for you know interpretation or subjectivity i mean it's it's part of our faith but if you're going to believe that you're believing in something that again you cannot it's not it's not it, it takes a great leap of faith to believe that and there is something in islam called al-ghaib the unseen that if you're that inherent in our faith is you have to believe in God, even though with, even though you can't see him in front of you. You can see all his creation around you, but there's the, there's the, the, the belief in God without, having, without seeing him or talking to him one-on-one. -on -one. Why that's the case, of course, I, I, I don't, I can, nobody can answer that. Traditionally, do people take that journey as something that literally happened? Like with a body. Yes, that's the debate that that has been had over the centuries, and which is very uh, interesting to my mind that some people believe that it was his physical body, and that that you know went on Barak to Jerusalem and then up to through the heavens. And I find it fascinating that 
people would say, Muslims would say that, when they also believe in the concept of a soul and an afterlife and a consciousness that exists beyond our body, and that our body are just, you know, as often said, meat suits, where, you know, this, this body is going to fade and our souls will continue. So there has been then that debate. But what I, I guess what I'm also believing, in, I think we are living in times now with all these stories of NDEs and OBEs coming out that should lay to rest the idea that it was his physical body that transported. It, it was, in my humble opinion, his soul, his consciousness that was transported uh, these great distances into these you know, heavenly realms. I think you mentioned this earlier that it would be a long story and maybe you could, you know, summarize it into something short, but can you tell us a little bit about what the Kaaba is? Sure. So <clears throat> during the time of Prophet Abraham now, which preceded who preceded Muhammad by thousands of years, uh, as, as the Quran describes it, and again, I'm going to paraphrase a lot here, that that Abraham, peace be upon him, uh, you know, during his time, there was the worshiping of idols. And that did not make sense to him. And so Abraham went to say, okay, I mean, the stone figure doesn't tell me whether I can breathe or it doesn't give have power. So then he turned to the stars and then he turned to the moon. And, you know, these also, this, you know, if, it, if there was an almighty God, the, you know, the moon wouldn't set and the stars wouldn't go away during the day, et cetera, et cetera. Finally, he came, the, 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 he received from God the confirmation of God's existence, if you will. Uh, uh, fast forward, Mo, uh, Abraham is an older gentleman. He's given the miraculous, uh, his wife is also old, but they're given the, well, his first son, Ishmael, is born. Okay. Ishmael is born to Hagar, okay, Hajar, as we call her. And Ishmael is his firstborn son. That's different from, I believe, how Christianity and Judaism see the first son being Isaac. But Ishmael and Islam is the firstborn son. And he is then, uh, he and Abraham decide to build, erect a building in dedication to the oneness of God. And that is the black cube that you see there. So for us as Muslims, we believe that that black cube was erected originally by Abraham and his son Ishmael. As a matter of fact, there's even the footprints of Abraham that are just, just next to the Kaaba there that, that uh, are, in, are enshrined as well. And so that, that, dedication to a monotheistic faith the belief in just one god uh is where is and 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 all that that in, 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 uh, entailed is uh really the central aspect of what our faith believes that there is just there is a there's a unity and a oneness of god that there's one creator <laughs> the creator of us all um and there's, you know, there's, there's, there's more to the story where when, when Hajar was pregnant uh, with Ismail, um, just outside, I mean, Abraham took her to this place just next to the Kaaba there between two hills. Today it's called Safa and Marwa. And she was pregnant and uh, she was desperate for water. Uh, she was left there by herself. Uh, there was a great jealousy between Sarah and Hajar. Uh, and so, uh, so Hagar was the, the mother of Ishmael. And today, uh, there's something called the Hajj. The Hajj is, uh, and it's just completed now, uh, where we as Muslims commemorate what Abraham did. And we commemorate based on, and, and the rituals of that come from Prophet Muhammad because he commemorated what Abraham did. So there's a great connection amongst the prophets for us as Muslims uh, and how we, again, central to our belief is the, the unity and the oneness of God. And that if you accept that, you often hear Islam is a religion of peace. Yes, Islam is a religion of peace for us personally, for our personal souls. It's a religion of justice, I think, for the world, if you will. 
But for, for us, you, it means you have submitted to the concept that there is nothing worthy of worship than one God. That if you're going to pray, you're not going to pray to your computer or to your, <laughs> to whatever else may, to money or whatever the materialistic things that you see in life, but you're submitting your will, your free will, and of your own free will to the will of God and God's will. And in doing so, you are then uh, rewarded with a peaceful heart, with a contented heart, with a grateful heart. It's interesting that you use the word submit because it seems like a theme among NDE people that when they finally submit, perhaps even submitting to God or letting go, that's when they have a spiritual transformation. Yeah, that's ex- you know that is exactly right. And I've had personal experience when I was younger of like just submitting to whatever God's will is. Uh, in my case, you know, when I was in my twenties, I was unemployed. I was desperate for a job. I was getting rejected by a whole bunch of places. And finally, I came home after a job interview one day, and I got down in in the Muslim prayer and put my head to the ground, and I said, God, whatever your will is, whatever you will to happen, if you want me to be homeless now, if you want me to just be destitute and not have a job for the rest of my time here on this earth, whatever your will is, let it be done, because your will and your knowledge about what needs to happen is much better than mine. And at literally the moment I completed my prayer, this is back in 1991 or something like that. The moment I completed my prayer, my phone rang. Mm. I picked up the phone and it was the interviewer from the interview I'd just gone on. He says, Omar, we'd love to hire you. Start. Monday and at that time it was 50 grand a year and I was like yeah I hung up the the phone and I prayed again in thankfulness and gratitude but you know one could say oh you know that just happened to be timing whatever I mean it was miraculous the way for me personally for Mm -hmm. me personally it was miraculous just you immediately finished my prayer and the phone rang and it was the job offer and this was after searching for months and being depressed and being being, you know, crying out to God. When I just said, whatever your will is, God, I submit to your will. Boom, something happened. And I don't, it doesn't happen every time. Mm -hmm. God knows better than you what you need. But the submission part of it then brings a peace and a tranquility, even in difficult times. Even in difficult times, it can bring a peace and tranquility. I personally feel that part of manifesting things is submitting to the outcome. Yeah or submitting that whatever you want is going to happen. In Islam, do they talk about manifestation or manifesting things at all? Yeah, I, I, that's another great question that I've um, thought about because, yeah, I mean, I, I, I know the theme that, you know, you, you manif- whatever you think you will manifest type of thing. Um, and that's a, that's a deep question. I mean, there is the concept of our own human free will and what we think. And there is the concept of Qadr of Allah, the will of God. And how those two intertwine, where does your free will end and where does God's will take over, if you will? Where does your f- the choices you make and what you do intersect with what God is willing to happen in, in your life is not clear to me. I mean, that's still something, I don't know if anybody, I don't think anybody can answer that, but the idea of manifestation is probably going to be more along the lines of what, for us as Muslims, what we would call God's will. Meaning that I can say that I want to manifest having a million dollars now, or manifest having a new home, or manifest having a new car, or something material right? Or manifest a better relation with my spouse or manifest a better, better health for myself, right? And certainly, I got to believe our own thoughts and our own actions and our own energy that we give off has a role in that. But overriding all of that is going to be God's will. So if it doesn't happen, if it doesn't go the way we expect it to go, 
then it is by God's will and you submit to that. It's okay. It's all right. I know that's a little bit different from what other people say. And just again, just to say one more thing about Abraham. When after Abraham built the Kaaba, he made a prayer to God that said, oh God, protect my, the generations that come after me from idol worshiping. Protect the generations that come after me from idol worshiping. But within, you know, two or three or four generations of his passing, idols were now being introduced into that very building that he created for the oneness of God. People were putting idols inside to, 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 to worship these stone idols instead of the oneness of God. And it's one of the lessons I draw, and by the way, and, and, that, and that, that changed altogether and stopped with the advent of Prophet Muhammad. The idols were then removed at that point. I guess what I'm driving at is that we can pray to God for something. We can ask God for something. But the answer to those prayers happen on God's time, not on our time. We are the created. He is our creator. He knows better than us about what we need and when we need it. So the manifestation question, I think, is there, but I think overriding all that is the, 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 the yes, the choices we make, but the will of God in our lives as well. All right, Omar, I need to switch gears with you here. Okay. After watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions or chit chat with you. Are you open sure. to that? And if so, yeah, how sure. can they reach you? Uh, I, I'm on Facebook and uh, oh, my name, Omar Ricci. And I'm also, my people can email me if they like. My email address is O-R-I-C-C-I-6-8 at gmail.com. All right. Do you have anything that you would like to share, like a book or a website or anything? Nothing in particular. I mean, I think, you know, there's the Quran. I mean, I would say if, if somebody's going to want to understand what the Quran is about, there's many translations. The best translation is one by a guy named Muhammad Asad. Uh, I think that's got the most contemporary English to it. So that would be the only thing I would say. And, but then outside of that, there's, there's plenty of literature out there that people can find if they're, if they're interested. And again, my idea was not to come on here to talk and to proselytize, mm -hmm. but more like to express my like, wow, there is such a comport such a similarity of what we hear about these NDEs and OBEs and some of the things we hear about in Islam. Now, I'm glad that you to me did. confirms the faith. I'm glad you did. And I feel like there are things within Islam that for me personally, and probably for a lot of people that adds pieces to the puzzle of life. It certainly has for me. Well, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? I would say that when times are tough in one's personal life, when you may get down about what's happening in the world around us, that there should be the understanding, the realization that this life is not what it's all about, that there is an afterlife, that our consciousness and our souls exist beyond this, this earth, and that if we do our lives, you know, with goodness, if you will, uh, we treat people well, that things will work out. Things will be okay. Omar, thank you so much again for being our guest. I really appreciate you, and I wish you the best. Thank you. You too. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.